Hi everyone, my name is Michael Herman and I have been running various online businesses over the past seven years. In these videos, I show you how my online businesses make money. My motivation for doing this is simply to teach you, to share my experiences so maybe you can also start your own online business or improve a business you might already have. I feel that if more people share their experiences in this way, then as a community of entrepreneurs, we can all benefit. Before I jump in, there's one thing I'd like to say about how I've organized this video. I'm sure you're busy and maybe you don't have time to watch all of this video. To help with this, I've split this video into separate modules. They're all contained in this video, but they are in sequence and they're self-contained. And the, I did it in such a way that the most general lessons come first. So you first get a very high level overview of the business and what I've learned and what you can learn from my experiences. And then it gets more and more specific. And you can simply watch this video until you've reached a point where you say, okay, I feel I've learned enough now and it's now getting so specific that it may not be applicable um, to you anymore. But either way, I feel that you will already in the first few minutes learn, gain some interesting insights that took me quite a long time to figure out for myself. So let me jump in. The business I want to talk to you about today is called F-Man. It is a file manager for Windows, Mac and Linux. It is an alternative to Explorer on Windows or Finder on Mac for managing files, browsing folders, copying files, extracting zip archives and so on and so forth. So you use it to work with your, the files on your local hard drive, for instance. And you can see a screenshot on the slide here. Fman is different from Explorer or Finder, for instance, in that it is targeted at programmers. Programmers like to do a lot on the computer by keyboard shortcuts. And that's something that Explorer and Finder are not really optimized for. And Fman is really strong in that respect. And if you know some keyboard shortcuts, then using it, you can be much faster to work with your files uh, than using the more traditional file managers. Fman's business model is that you can download a free trial version of Fman from its website. But when you start it, you're greeted with a nag screen. So you're greeted with this dialogue and the dialogue says, welcome to Fman. To remove this annoying pop-up, please buy a license or you need to click a button by hand uh, to remove the dialogue or to get rid of this dialogue for this one invocation of Fman. And you can use it um, however you want after that. But still this pop-up at the beginning when you start Fman is very annoying. If you do want to uh, buy Fman, then it's a one-time uh, one payment of $18. So you go to Fman's website, it's shown here in the screenshot, and you select the number of licenses you want, and then you click on this pay button and then you enter your credit card details or your PayPal account information. And then you automatically receive a license key by email. And once you've uh, installed this license key, then Fman no longer shows you the annoying pop-up. Optionally, when you buy Fman, you can subscribe to get updates to Fman. So this also gives you access to new versions of Fman as they are released. So how is this business doing? I've been working on it since 2016. So that's been three years. I've spent 3,300 hours roughly um, working on it. So that is quite a long time. 
I have sold 964 licenses for a total profit of around $19,000. This puts my hourly wage of working on this business at a modest $6 per hour. Things are looking a little bit better when you look at them, how much money Fman is making now and how much uh, time I need to invest to keep it running. At the moment, I need to spend around 12 hours per month on average to keep Fman running, to release new versions with important bug fixes, to answer support requests and so on and so forth. I sell about one license per day, maybe a bit less, but not a lot less. And that brings in a monthly profit of, together with the update subscription of around $600 per month. So right now, my hourly wage is around $50 an hour, which is better, but still for a programmer like myself, not a very great salary. There are three main lessons I learned from working on FMAN for so long. The first is don't spend 3000 hours working on something that isn't really making any money. Um, it's important to love what you do. And the reason I spent so much time working on FMAN is that I truly care about the project. I really feel that such a project and product should exist in this world. But loving a project isn't enough. If it is to be sustainable and if it is to be a business, then it needs to pay the bills. And FMAN, while it has some success, unfortunately, never quite, quite reached the stage where I could really confidently say, okay, it is okay now for me to continue working on it full time. And the final and uh, lesson I want to mention in this first module is that desktop applications are very hard. As a program that runs on Windows, Mac and Linux, FMAN uh, needs to be tested on all of these platforms. And all the platforms are very different, of course. And it's a lot of work simply to create and then keep going an application that runs on uh, a desktop operating system. Things It's much easier, for instance, in comparison to create a an app for your mobile phone or a website. So that's one thing I learned that uh, this is much more difficult. And while all these things may sound a bit bleak, I do encourage you to keep watching maybe a few more minutes or just a little while, because even though the financial success of this project isn't great, I learned a great deal uh, in working on it for so long. So I recommend uh, you stick around just a little bit longer. There are very, in my eyes, uh, important lessons uh, to be learned here. Module two, from zero users to many dollars. Say you have a product idea and you want to, you think you want to create this new amazing service in the world. How do you go from your initial idea without having any customers or users to getting your first customers, the first people who actually pay you for what you've built? This is what I did for FMAN and in this module I will show you how. Before I go into how I did that exactly, let me show you what I was able to achieve with FMAN. When FMAN launched, which was about one year after I started working on it, I sold out its first 100 licenses in 48 hours. On that day, FMAN was the top, in the top 10 of products of the day on Product Hunt, and it was also very popular on other websites which led to FMAN's website getting up to 170 concurrent visitors. In total, FMAN's website got about 14,500 visitors in just a few days of the launch. And here are some screenshots of what this looked like um, in the Google Analytics. So in short, when I started selling licenses for FMAN, 
and made it really publicly available for the first time, I re received a very, very positive response from people. And now I will show you exactly how I did that and how I got to that stage and that day and what worked well for me. If you are thinking of starting a new product, I highly recommend that the first thing you do is a very thorough market research. Sit down for a, one, two, three days and research online which competing products and services are available to what you want to build. There are many important reasons for this. One is you may find out that the thing you want to build already exists in, in such a way that you might not be able to outdo it. If you find that this is the case, then the market research just saved you years of your life of working on a product that might not make sense uh, to create. Second, by looking at the competition, you can learn what they are doing, what you can copy or what you can improve on. So that's also very, very interesting and important. And third, you also learn about their positioning. You learn, okay, maybe one of your, there's competition that targets, say, large businesses, but you might be able to target smaller businesses and thus fill, fill a special niche um, that others are not yet targeting. So I highly recommend it, it really can pave the way for your future direction to do a proper market research. It's not wasted time. The next thing I did for FMAN, and I recommend you do too, is if you decide that your product is worth pursuing further, to create a landing page. So here is a screenshot of FMAN's very, very first website. It's very simple. It has a screenshot which showed what FMAN will look like or would look like in the future. And below it, there was a button that said, request early access. And we, when people clicked on the button, they could enter their email address. And I could use this website to, I could point people at this website so they could read a little about FMAN and decide whether they're interested in it. And if they are interested in it, they could give me their email address to be updated. Then I started a blog also on FMAN's website and started with the first article that really laid the foundation of my philosophy behind the project. But then I kept writing as time progressed more and more blog articles where I showed on the one hand my progress of working on FMAN, but also some thought pieces on what, why the project is important, what my approach to it is. And I could use these articles to share them on uh, platforms. So to spread the word, to get people to look at what I've, I'm building and make them excited about the idea. So in my case, um, I, you see screenshots here of many of the links that I posted to various platforms. On the top left, there's Hacker News, which is a forum for startup founders, mostly in Silicon Valley, but also programmers. On the top right, there is Reddit, and you see here how many articles I posted to Reddit about FMAN or its various blog posts. I got in touch with people via Twitter. So here someone mentioned an old file manager called, called Norton Commander, and I found this through the Twitter search functionality. And so I replied to them, hey, if you like Norton Commander, then you may be interested in the file manager I'm developing. So you start spreading the word. And finally, a website that proved very useful for me as well was a website called Betalist. It's a platform for very new and up and coming products and services. And the people who visit this website are just interested in trying out new things. And I managed to get FMAN featured on this website and got quite a few early users um, who tried out FMAN this way and some of which also stuck around. So this step consists of spreading the word wherever your users or target audience might be online or maybe even in the real world, um, direct them to their website so they enter their email address and you can um, keep them in the loop. 
once you have their email address, you don't just um, tell them, okay, you don't just send them promotional material, but you also talk to them. So what I did with FMAN was I sent them people who just supplied their email address on FMAN's website. I sent them an email saying, hi, thank you for your interest. The current development status is this and that. But in the meantime, until I'm ready and until the very first version is available, I would love to hear why you're interested in FMAN. Let me know what are your pain points? What are you trying to solve? What, what's your context? And people replied uh, and gave really interesting insights into what was important for them. And by talking to them, I managed to establish in a way personal connections and make them also more excited about the project on the one hand, but also on the other hand, really learn what I needed to focus on um, if I wanted this thing to be useful for other people as well and not just myself. And after a while, I was ready to release the very first version of f So I had been gathering people's email addresses, I had been talking to people, and finally I was able to release a very, very first, very basic version. So what I did was I wrote a blog post saying, yeah, finally the first version of f is out. And on the other hand, I emailed all the people who had given me their email address, telling them, yeah, you know this thing I've been telling you about, finally it's available. Uh, it's still very um, raw and it might not work perfectly well, but, but I would love to hear what you think. Please download it and try it out and, and let me know your thoughts. And people did and kept giving me feedback. And so I had a few cycles then of iter taking their feedback and implementing it if I thought it was useful and I agreed with it. Uh, sending them the latest version, then they would tell me again, yeah, okay, now it's not crashing anymore, but I still needed to do this. So there were a few cycles of going back and forth with them, really trying to bring it into a more robust and polished form. And after a while, after doing this for a while, I was ready to launch f -Man, which meant for me to a make it publicly available. So available not just to people who are willing to give me their email address, but to anybody who wants to download it and play around with it, but also to start charging money for it. And the first thing I did was to set a date for the launch. So a launch is kind of a press event in a way. So you want to set a like, specific date that you can target and work towards. So I set a date. In my case, this was roughly one month into the future. From the time I decided, okay, FMAN is now stable enough, um, I can make it public. And that gave, I had then had one month to set up payment um, on FMAN's website. So up until that point, FMAN's website could not process credit card payments. So I had to implement this. And similarly, then inside FMAN, once people had purchased a license, I needed a way to verify that the license they purchased and typed into FMAN was actually correct and so on and so forth. So I, I did this and once you've set a date, you also want to tell your users. So hopefully you already have an email list, the people that have given you their addresses and that you've been staying in touch with. And uh, now you can tell them, hey, in one month, this thing is going to be live and you're going to be able to buy a license, um, but you're going to be able to do so at a special price as a thank you for being such an early adopter. And then you keep emailing them. So you then two, two weeks later, you tell them, yeah, hey, now it, the preparations are going well. In two weeks is the big day. And then a week later, you email them again and tell them, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's so close. I'm all, almost there. I can't wait. It's going to be amazing. Next week is the big day. And then on the day before, you email them again. Yeah, you know, I told you you can get like licenses for cheaper. Uh, and this is going to be t tomorrow. So I, like really make sure to watch out for my emails tomorrow. And then on the day off, of course, you also email everybody and tell them, yeah, guys, now finally the big day has come. Uh, check it out. And Another thing I did was I limited the supply of FMAN licenses. So 
I said, didn't just say, okay, admin license will be available, whatever. I said, you can only buy FMAN licenses for three days and it's going to be a very, very special price, the cheapest price you'll ever get. And I will only make 100 licenses available. And I justified both of these things by saying first that it will really be a super special and cheap price. And second, that I wanted to uh, really support the first people who paid for FMAN exceptionally well and I needed to know who's in and who isn't um, to really be able to focus my energies on the right people and that was very successful limiting the supply people some people bought Afman coming to the website without ever having tried it they only saw oh damn this is only available today it's cheap I'll just buy it and then see later so this worked exceptionally well but it was also criticized. But as I said, as a sales tactic, it worked well. And then once I had set everything up and the big, the day of the big launch was there, I posted it to the usual platforms. Um, in my case, this was Product Hunt and Hacker News. But generally, you want to post to wherever your users are. Where if your target audience is somewhere else, then you need to go there and tell the people there that your thing is now available. And so in summary, say you have a product idea, you want to create a new product or a service. How do you go from this day of having the idea to the day that some it's ready in a way and somebody is actually giving you money for it? I would highly recommend you start by doing market research to first determine does it make sense to continue with this idea and second to maybe get a feeling for the best direction in which you should take your idea. Then I would suggest creating a landing page where you can gather people's email addresses and telling the world about using this um, landing page or website about the thing you're working on. Get people excited about it. Once you have finished implementing your first version, you release it to the people um, that are on your mailing list. You gather their feedback. You ask them, okay, so have you tried it? What do you think? Um, what should I improve? And they will hopefully tell you. And then if you feel that what they say makes sense for your vision, you use that feedback to actually improve the product. And then you repeat this cycle for a few times until you feel you're ready that it, you can make this your product really publicly available and maybe even start charging money for it. And this is the day when you launch. And I just before I gave you the steps I used, in my opinion, quite successfully to prepare and uh, start working towards this day. And after launch, uh, you essentially keep iterating. People, hopefully you will gain users continuously. Uh, they will tell you what they need. You figure out whether their feedback makes sense for you. And if it does, you uh, improve the product and that helps you get new and more users and so on and so forth. And that's pretty much what I did for FMAN and it worked quite well and I hope that these steps or something similar to these steps or at least some of these steps will also help you. Module 3. Things I would do again. In this one slide module I would briefly like to mention the things beyond the ones we've already discussed that I feel worked well with FMAN and which you may find interesting as well. The first is that FMAN gathers anonymous usage statistics. You can find documentation about this on FMAN's website if you're interested. Uh, there you can also find steps you can take to verify that the data that FMAN gathers this way truly is anonymous. And this led to very interesting insights as to how people were using FMAN. I described in the previous module that FMAN is optimized, 
optimized to be used by the keyboard. And it's the way you use F1 is quite special and it requires a bit of learning. And one thing these usage statistics revealed was that most people did not understand this when they were first starting f -Man. So they downloaded f -Man, they started it, and then they clicked, clicked around randomly, and it was very clear that they were not really getting any value out of f -Man because they were using it with the mouse. One solution to this was to improve f -Man's onboarding. So when I realized that people don't understand what f -Man's approach is, I implemented a tutorial in FMAN. So when you start FMAN for the very first time, it asks, hey, would you like to take a very brief tour that lets you hit the ground running with FMAN and shows you the most important features so you can get the most value out of it. And quite a few people agree to this. And then this tutorial shows them, hey, so, you know, F1 is meant to be used with the keyboard. Here are the most important shortcuts and so on and so forth. And again, the usage statistic, the, the anonymous usage statistics uh, really then showed that this did make people stick around more and understand f -Man better. A related thing are drip emails. So Today, again, you, if you want to download FMAN, you need to supply your email address. This is uncommon uh, in the niche of desktop applications, um, but uh, it turned out that it's very useful. So when you download FMAN and you give your email address, then you get an email from me saying, hi, welcome to FMAN. Here's a link to the most important uh, things you might want to know. But then also, on the day after and then a few days after, uh, you get further emails, not too many, and it's not really not too spammy. I think you get three emails in total, so it's really not too much, where I remind you and say, yeah, hey, okay, now it's you downloaded FMAN a few days ago. Hopefully, you've already found some uh, value in using it, but, and here's some other things you might find interesting with links to FMAN's website that showed extra features. And these reminders um, about FMAN made people come back to using FMAN and also they established a more personal connection between me and FMAN's new users. I'm very personal in, i.e. very approachable in these emails. I'm like, hey, I'm Michael, I'm the creator, I hope you're doing well, just like I'm talking to you in this video now. And I feel that this um, uh, makes people understand that there's a human being, me, uh, at the other end of FMAN and that they can ask me questions if they like and so on and so forth. And so it really helps establish this personal, personal connection. So those emails were also quite effective, even though they are somewhat unusual uh, for a desktop application. And the final thing that worked really well for me uh, was to be transparent. You can tell in this video now, I'm very open about everything regarding FMAN and its business. And on FMAN's newsletter, um, uh, which I kept sending out maybe once a month or so, I was always extremely open and honest about what was going on with FMAN, what my struggles were. And people wrote back many times to tell me they really appreciated this honesty and this um, just being a normal guy and not pretending to be a big corporation and super professional. Um, I feel like you can still be professional while at the same time being a human being. And I felt that my tra this transparent approach transported this one. So these are the top four things I would do again and hopefully will be able to do again in further projects and maybe you will find them useful as well. Just like there are things that I would do again if I were to work on FMAN again or another projects, there are also some things I learned that I would not do again. These are things I would do differently. The first pertains to online payments. 
if you're running an online business or if you want to run an online business, there will come a day, hopefully, where you need to be able to charge people money online. There are many providers that help you with this. Popular ones are Stripe and PayPal, for instance. So what they let you do is essentially that they let you, for instance, um, add a credit card form to your website. They charge the customer if the customer enters the credit card details into the form. And then Stripe or PayPal or these providers send you the money minus some fee that the customer paid. The drawback of providers uh, such as Stripe and PayPal is that you still need to deal with a lot of things yourself. One thing, for instance, is taxes. So I am based in Austria, in Europe, and in, in the European Union, we have a law that states that we need to charge the customer um, tax, VAT, uh, depending on where they live, if they live in the European Union. So if someone, if I have a customer that buys from Germany, then I need to charge that customer the German VAT rate. Whereas if the customer buys from Spain, then I need to charge him the Spanish VAT rate and I need to collect this tax and then pay it to the respective country. So when using Stripe and PayPal, for instance, I need to do these things. And not just this, but also issuing invoices. Uh, also, for instance, when you're offering a subscription service, you need to worry about, things, at least with Stripe, with PayPal not so much, but at least with Stripe, you need to worry about things such as how does the customer renew their sub subscription? What happens if the credit card that they're using for their subscription is expires? You need to give them a way to, you need to provide them with a form where they can update their credit card details. You need to implement the logic of what should happen if the, when the subscription expires and uh, all these things. And it's a lot of work, actually, especially when it comes to subscriptions. So there are also alternative uh, providers such as FastSpring, PayHip, Gumroad and many others that don't act as pure payment providers, but rather they act as resellers. So uh, as far as I understand legally, it's not like they you sell online businesses and services to customers directly, but rather these resellers act as an intermediary and you sell them the right to sell your products, but they um, do all the tax related stuff and invoicing and so on and forth uh, uh, with the customer. So with these uh, resellers and with these providers, you don't need to worry about invoicing and taxes. Uh, in return, they charge a higher fee than Stripe or PayPal, but it makes your life a whole lot easier. Fman uses Stripe and PayPal because I did not really know about these other providers when I started working on it. But if I were to do it again and for future projects, if at all possible, I would at least start out by using one of these providers. FastSpring uh, is very well established, well known, it's very stable. It's not very pretty, but it's very powerful. It's, it seems a bit old, but it can do a lot. PayHip is I really like PHIP. It's very pretty and it works well for cost for people like me who are based in the European Union. Other people, especially if you're based in the US, I say good things about Gumroad. Personally, I have not had great experiences with Gumroad. Um, their support was slow for me and their interface was buggy, but many people really like it. But either way, whichever provider you end up choosing, I highly recommend that if you can, you go with one of these resellers, at least at first, because it gets you started more quickly um, than using Stripe and PayPal directly. It just makes your life a lot easier. The second thing I would not repeat was if you come to FMAN's website from the United States, then 
I detect that you're from the United States using your IP address and show you FMAN's prices in dollars. Whereas if you come from a different country, then I show you FMAN's prices in euros. And the idea is that this will make it seem more natural for people from the US or for instance, for people from Europe. And while I'm sure this works to some extent, so it might pay off uh, in that few more people may buy FMAN because the, the experience is more native to them. Given FMAN's low sales volume, I don't believe that um, this really makes a lot of e extra money. And it was, I mean, at least some effort to implement and it's certainly a lot of effort. Uh, to deal with this when it comes to accounting and invoicing, because then I have to remember for each F invoice, oh, did I charge this customer in dollars or euros? And if I charge them in dollars, which is not the currency in which I pay my taxes, I need to then convert the dollars to euros according to published exchange rates by the Austrian tax agency. So it's like, it's a, it's a pain and it's completely unnecessary. So here, uh, it's also related to payment. I would simply use my home currency, which is euros and worry about maybe improving this if I reached a much higher scale. And I think the, these two lessons that I learned can be summed up very nicely. And that is keep it simple. Do what like start with the simplest approach that works for your business and then only if you can prove uh, that it makes sense and it pays off to invest more effort into refining one aspect of your business or your approach spend the time then but don't spend it in advance try to start off with whatever is easiest at first so you've now seen many of the lessons that I learned from working on FMAN for such a long time. What you may not have seen as much of is really the context in which I've, I made these experiences. So in this final module, I would like to tell you a bit more about FMAN's journey and about where it is today. I got the initial idea for FMAN in 2015 when I switched from Windows to Mac. On Windows, I had been using a tool or a file manager called Total Commander. And on Mac, there simply wasn't a good alternative to this program um, that was available. So I thought that I could create something similar to Total Commander, but more modern in many ways. Uh, that was when I had the initial idea. In April 2016, I decided to go all in on this. I really started working on FMAN full time, first by doing the market research that I mentioned in a previous uh, module, then creating a website, a landing page, etc. Already three months later, I was able to release this version V0 that I also mentioned before. I had already gathered the email addresses from a few people. And so they gave me a lot of feedback then on how they liked it, whether it worked for them and so on and so forth. And by the January 2017, so half a year later, <clears throat> the 1000th person um, downloaded and tried FMAN for the very first time. And as I explained before, I reached these 1000 people by blogging, by being active on forums, by um, interacting with people on Twitter, simply doing the work to spread the word about FMAN. And I somehow managed to get these 1000 people to come to FMAN's website and leave their email address and then got in touch with them. In March, so another two months later of 2017, I started, I had FMAN's big launch, uh, which I felt was quite successful and started selling the first licenses. Then the rest of 2017 was dedicated to further incremental improvements. 
And at the end of 2017, revenue was $350 per month. And 2018 was very similar. There were no big breakthroughs in terms of features. It was simply slow, consistent work of listening to user feedback and implementing the features or making the bug fixes that they asked for. And at the end of 2018, FMN made on average $650 per month in revenue. The current status is that every day around 50 people download FMAM, but the number of people who use FMAM per day stays roughly constant at around 300 people. The problem is if FMAM was so great that people started using it and then kept using it, then the number of people who use it per day would grow because every day new people download FMAN and if they stick around, then the number of people who are using FMAN per day would grow. Unfortunately, as I said, it doesn't. It stays pretty much constant and 300 people. This is a product problem. FMAN simply isn't yet good enough um, for many people. It's still missing important features. Um, features that are often requested are custom themes, so people want to be able to change FMAN's colors, for instance. They want multiple tabs, or they want to search for files, um, which frankly is very reasonable to would want to do in a file manager, and many other features. So I personally use FMAN every day, and 300 other people use it every day too. But for most new users, FMAN is not yet feature complete enough uh, to really be their main file manager. And the problem is that adding these extra features would be and is a lot of work. Um, it's simply not easy to add multiple or that easy to add multiple tabs um, or implement logic for custom themes or file search. Certainly all these things are possible and they're not rocket science either, but they take a lot of effort. And the problem is that this effort, given how little, frankly, money FMAN makes, uh, it's likely that this effort will never pay off. And so the final thing I want to see and repeat that I've learned is that desktop applications simply are very hard and a lot of work. FMAN supports Windows, Mac and Linux, so all the main platforms, and that's a unique selling point of FMAN. As I mentioned before, Total Commander is a nice piece of software, if a bit old school, but it's only available on Windows. And modern developers, which are FMAN's target audience, often use many different operating systems and one of FMAN's unique selling proposition points or propositions is that it's available on multiple platforms. But that's a lot of work because then you need to address all the differences uh, between these platforms when developing it. Another um, thing that's hard in desktop applications is the handling of license keys. So when a user purchases your software, then you need to generate a license key and then in your software you need to have logic that verifies that the license key is correct. And then some people are unable to install the license key so they send report, support requests or, or maybe they enter uh, an incorrect email address when they buy your software and so on and so forth. Another uh, topic that was uh, in, uh, difficult when implementing FMAN was automatic updates. So like most modern software, FMAN has a mechanism that lets me as the developer release a new version in such a way that if you have installed FMAN on your computer, you are automatically receive this new version. This is extremely powerful because it enables a very rapid development cycle. If there's a bug in FMAN and the user tells me about it, then I can release a new version um, that fixes this bug within an hour or two. And because I'm able to release fixes so quickly, I can also uh, don't have to be quite as thorough 
in testing, in regression testing, because uh, I know that if I make made a mistake, um, I can fix it quite easily. And so this is really powerful and it's been very helpful, but it was also a lot of work to set up the necessary infrastructure. Another common problem uh, of FMAN and desktop apps in general are antivirus tools um, that incorrectly flag your software as malware and there's not really much you can do about it, but you still get support requests from people saying, sorry, I can't use your software because my antivirus says it's a virus or it may contain a virus, which is of course not the case for FMAN, but uh, there's not much I can do about it. And there are many other um, headaches that really are unique to desktop apps. So the main takeaway of this module that I would like to um, point out to you is if you're thinking of creating a software product and if you have the option of implementing it either as a website or a desktop application or say a mobile app, um, then I would recommend, if possible again, that you Try not to implement it as a desktop application, but as an application on one of these other uh, technologies, uh, because this simply lets you avoid many of these um, headaches uh, that I just pointed out to you. And with this, I would like to leave you. Um, if you'd like to learn more, I recommend you take a look at the FMAN blog. As I mentioned before, I kept blogging and I keep blogging on it about the things I learned. I'm very transparent there and quite a few of the things that I mentioned in this video may have also been mentioned or even described in more detail there. So maybe you'd like to browse through and maybe if you see a keyword that strikes your eye, read more closely. Um, if you would like to learn more about me and other projects I have been working on, Check out my personal website at Herman with double R and double M dot IO. Thank you very much for watching all, all this way up to this point. I hope you found it valuable. I hope you found it useful. And I hope that you have a lot of success with your own projects.